Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Welcome and hello everyone to this episode from the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. Today, I am going to delve into a topic that for some may feel a bit controversial. It's something that we have heard about, we discuss. It's an integral part of being a mental health clinician. But what does it mean? How do we work with it? How do we understand it is the controversial part. I'm going to be offering my perspective and the perspective from the synergetic play therapy model to help us maybe just look at this from a different angle and to tease this apart just a little bit more. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about that big scary word counter transference. So let's even begin this conversation with defining countertransference. And in order to do that, we should probably also define what transference is. So transference and countertransference, we learned about it in our courses. It is something that we hear a lot about in the field. What is it really? So let's start first with transference. So transference is really a dynamic that occurs in therapy between the client and the therapist. And transference specifically is when the client redirects or transfers an unconscious feeling, desire, or expectation from another towards their therapist. So for example, the therapist may remind the client of the client's mother or sister or brother or father. And as such, the client then begins to interact with the therapist as if the therapist is that individual. So in a sense, transferring the projection of that individual onto the therapist. So then what is countertransference, which is really the reverse of the transference. It's the same process but it is the therapist towards the client. So this is really our emotional reaction to our clients. Who do our clients remind us of? Our projection onto our clients from our own history, our own past experiences, etc., etc. So some of you may have learned about transference and countertransference in a way that is different than how I'm about to explain it. I am just going to reference this in the way that I have come in contact with it in my studies and in the things that I have read, which is that it is something that happens in the therapeutic relationship and it is something that we really need to be aware of. The way that I was trained and taught about it was something that we really needed to have our eyes open towards, our ears open towards, and really needed to have a lot of caution around it, especially the counter-transference part, which is what we're really going to focus on in this particular podcast. So in some of the programs that I have taken and books that I have read, there's this felt sense of when I respond or when I have an experience where I am engaging in countertransference with my client, that I really need to check myself at the door, so to speak. I really need to be aware of that and then time for me to go to do my own work, do my own therapy, etc., etc., etc. Here's what I want to say about that. Yes, and. 
And this and word is so important. And that's why we're having this conversation. And I'm really grateful that we're having this dialogue. I just wish you were all sitting in front of me right now so that we could talk about this back and forth and ask questions and get into more dialogue about this. So in order to take this where I want to go, I want to share a quote with you. And it is a quote from Severn Fisher. For those of you that are not familiar with her work, she has written a book called Neurofeedback and the Treatment of Developmental Trauma, Calming the Fear-Driven Brain. It's part of the Norton series of interpersonal neurobiology. And this is her quote, and I just love this quote so much. She says this, countertransference and transference are always co-arising and co-constructing at the place where the therapist's experience meets that of the patient. I want to read that to you again. Countertransference and transference are always co-arising and co-constructing at the place where the therapist's experience meets that of the patient. When I came across this quote, it was like everything inside of me went, yes, 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 because this is something that we have talked about for years and years in synergetic play therapy. So the and part of what I said earlier is this. It's not something that happens sometimes. It is the therapeutic landscape. Listeners, transference and countertransference is the therapeutic landscape. You can't avoid it. You can't get out of it. You can't check it at the door. It's not something that you can actually separate yourself out of because what exists in a moment is the projective experience. As the client is playing, you are going to have an experience of their play. As the client is telling you a story, you are going to have an experience of their story. As you are interacting with the client, they are having an experience of you. And what we bring to that moment is projection. In those moments, we are constantly in our brain making associations to past experiences. And so this idea that somehow we can, we need to be aware of it so that maybe we can either avoid it all or at minimum, you want to make sure that we're really on top of it is, is useful. Um, The problem is, is that we can't avoid it and, and maybe there's something inherent about it that's incredibly wise. Maybe it isn't something that we have to actually check at the door. Maybe it isn't something when we have an experience that we need to quickly wrap it up and put it put it away in a little box and say, okay, I'll get to that later when I finish the session and I go call my therapist and I, and I schedule a, a therapy session. So here's what I want to say about it that when we have an experience in the playroom or with our with our the parents that we're working with or whoever it is that we're working with clinically as we have an experience and we have an experience of whatever it is that's coming up it is essential on one level that we are mindfully aware of what is getting activated in us that we become more and more curious about our own responses and our own reactions, especially when we're having heightened responses in our autonomic nervous system, especially when we find ourselves moving really quickly towards the end of our window of tolerance, or when we find ourselves resisting or resenting or wanting to avoid interacting with our client. When, when it's at that level, yes, absolutely, let's get curious. What is it that's being activated in me? What is it about this client that is, you know, who is this reminding me of? What experience within myself is this reminding me of? Is my client mirroring some aspect of me that's challenging? For those of you that haven't heard the podcast episode called Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, My Client is Me After All, I highly suggest that you listen to that one after this one to enhance this conversation that we're having now. 
So yes, we do need to be very aware of our countertransference. Yes, when we identify that there is a pattern or that we are highly activated, yes, we do need to go do our own work. And it isn't something that we have to be afraid of. It isn't something that we have to avoid. There is this perception in our field that countertransference is scary and that in some circles I've heard of it talked about even as, as bad. I want to help us shift that perception into why is it there in the first place? What's, what are some of the benefits of it? So for those of you that have studied synergetic play therapy, or if you haven't, if you've read my book, Aggression in Play Therapy, or have just been a, you know, a fan of these podcasts, you've, you've heard me talk about this concept in synergetic play therapy called the setup or the offering. And what this is really speaking to is this quote that Suburn Fisher was talking about, that there is an interaction, there is an experience that happens in that place where our experience meets that of the patient. So when our clients come into relationship with us, they walk into our office, they jump online if we're having a teletherapy session, we jump on the phone with a parent. However, wherever that mo those moments are that we're interacting, our nervous systems say hello. We, we say hello to each other. We start to feel each other. We start to get to know each other on a level that occurs way below conscious awareness. We start to deeply attune to each other. And as all of that begins to happen, what ends up happening is that naturally, naturally, as we are engaging with the words, the stories, the nonverbals, the, the behavior patterns, the play itself, the content of the stories, as we are interacting with that, we inevitably have our associations that are connected to all of that that is arising. And as a result, our own physiology shifts accordingly. And as our physiology shifts accordingly, as our nervous system is saying hello, I almost want you to imagine hearing this as a dance, a dance with no words, a dance below conscious awareness where I'm saying hello, you're saying hello, you are getting a sense of my inner world, I'm getting a sense of your inner world. And in that space where we are meeting, back to Severn Fisher's quote, we are co-arising and co-constructing each moment as those moments begin to unfold. In that experience, we are in a sense feeling what it feels like to be the client in front of us. Now, the part where uh, transference and counter-transference so beautifully um, weaves into this discussion is this. When we say hello to our clients on the level of nervous system activation, on the level of resonance, on the level of attunement, there is a shared felt sense that occurs. So as an example, if my client is in a moment of anxiety, my system will experience that anxiety as well. I will feel that. There will be shifts that happen inside of me as a result of that. That is where we are a we. That is where we are having a shared experience and where we are now differentiated in that space is the transference and the counter-transference. So even though we are having a shared experience of the anxiety in that moment, my client's associations with that anxiety or with me in a moment in that anxiety those are my client's associations. That's my client's transference. As I am dancing in this anxiety with my client, simultaneously I am having associations. I am having um, experiences from my past that are coming into the present moment, and I am projecting those into the space. That's the counter-transference. 
So you can see how it's not something that we can avoid. It is that therapeutic landscape. In every moment of unfolding, there is both a shared resonant experience via the setup or the offering as we talk about it in synergetic play therapy. And simultaneously, there's also an experience of transference and countertransference as the past is being projected right there into the present moment. The beauty of this is that in that moment, it holds all the information we need in order for healing to occur. That moment has within it the present and the past weaving together to say hello. As clinicians, it is our job to be able to mindfully hold this. This is where we talk about, can I be with myself without being swept away in the activation that's occurring in my system? Can I be aware that I'm becoming activated without necessarily getting caught up in the activation where I am now flooding and I am being taken over by the projections? Can I be aware in a moment Wow, as we are playing through this sadness, it is reminding me of whatever that experience is that it's reminding me of. As I'm interacting with this client's parent or caregiver, can I simultaneously be aware of, wow, that feels really similar to an experience I had when I was a child. As I mindfully sit in this, and this is such the beauty, because it goes back to that resonant place, as I allow myself to sit in that felt sense of the transference and countertransference, I am allowing myself to hold both my world and the client's world, which allows me a greater depth of attunement it allows me a greater depth of authenticity. Here's the difference. If I felt something and that feeling was, was really activating or all of a sudden I had a felt sense of, gosh, you know, this person's reminding me of this or this experience reminding me of this and I quickly tried to shut it down, put it in that box and tell myself, I'm going to get to it to later. What I just put in the box is the very information I may need to be able to work with whatever it was that I needed to work with in that moment. There is a reason why that just came up. There is a reason why that activation just surfaced. Likely because you're having a shared resonant experience with the client. Again, the felt sense is similar. Your associations to it are yours. The client's associations to it are theirs. But when I take that whole thing and I put it, I try to check it at the door, which I don't even know how that's possible. But as we take that and we try to put it in a box or we try to put a lid on it, which really means shutting down part of ourself, which really means compartmentalizing ourself, we're actually shutting off part of the, the information exchange that's happening between us and the client. We're actually potentially, again, closing the door on the very thing that is a lot able to give us insight into the world of our client and what it must feel like on a felt sense to possibly be the client. It is a confusing place. It is a place where things are gray. And I'm going to keep saying the word and, and it is our job to be able to sit in it and be with it and to, and to trust that the activation that's arising is purposeful, that there's a reason why it's coming up. And it's not just yours, by the way, that the reason why that's being activated in you also is because it is also reflective potentially of what's happening inside of our client. So I'm going to take a deep breath here. I'm going to invite you also to take a deep breath. As I once again read the quote, countertransference and transference are always co-arising and co-constructing at that place where the therapist's experience meets that of the patient. So if that is true, and I try to avoid countertransference or I deny that it's occurring, 
Can you see that we're also avoiding deepening into that meeting place where we meet our client's experience with them? So as we are talking about this, and I'm making the point here that it, it's, it is the therapeutic landscape, you can't avoid it, the question would be, well, what do we do when it arises? Well, let's, let's again define this a little bit more. How do we even know that it arises? Well, the first thing for us to realize again is that it's always arising. It's there every single moment. So it's more than about trying to identify, oh, has, it, has, counter has counter transference arisen in this moment? And more of, all right, I'm noticing that I'm activated in some way. How do I work with my activation? Well, I've been saying it so far through the perspective of we have to become mindfully aware of our own experience. I'm talking about learning how to become regulated in the midst of our dysregulation. How do we connect to ourselves in the middle of our countertransference? How do we begin to take a deep breath? How do we begin to move? How do I begin to acknowledge within me that I'm activated? When we talk about countertransference and synergetic play therapy, we talk about it and describe it as we are having an authentic, congruent response to the child's initiated play. Countertransference doesn't mean that when we're feeling activated that all of a sudden we tell our client the reasons why we are activated or that it's reminding us of something. It is simply about acknowledging the activation, which again can happen with a deep breath. Maybe it happens with just a, a movement in your body. Maybe it happens with naming a felt sense experience. Whew, that was a lot. Or, wow, I'm feeling nervous. Or whatever it is that feels congruent with the play. Again, an authentic congruent response to their initiated play. I'll also add in, or to their initiated story. So they play, they share a story, we join them in that felt sense, we engage in transference and countertransference, our system naturally gets activated. How do we then recognize that that is where all the information is to help us really attune to the client? So again, rather than pushing it away, how do I take a deep breath? How do I connect to myself in it? Become even more aware, more mindful, more present within myself, while I'm simultaneously having a relationship with the counter-transference and the activation that's happening inside of my body. And then yes, afterwards, if it feels relevant, then we go, what was that? That felt really big. That was really intense. It was really hard for me to stay connected to myself. That kept me right at my edge of my window of tolerance. I felt like I kept flooding. It's hard for me to set boundaries. Those are all then those signals again that say, all right, it's time for us to go do more of our personal work because the counter transference, the activation that's arising is too much to hold. And so what do I need to do so that I can allow it to integrate into my system so that I can still hold a large window of tolerance so that the client then can begin to borrow my nervous system in those moments, borrow my regulation in the midst of my dysregulation as the client also begins to move towards their transference, their own activation. So, transference and countertransference, everyone, is the therapeutic landscape. You don't need to be afraid of it. You can't check it at the door even if you wanted to. It's not something that you need to avoid, nor is it something that you could avoid even if you wanted to. It is something to embrace. It is something to recognize and to really ask the question, if this is the landscape, what is the gift in it? How do I use this? What information might be present in the transference and countertransference that actually may be the most important information that I need in order to attune to myself, 
to attune to my client and ultimately help my client integrate whatever it is that my client is currently working on. So hopefully this discussion is making you think. Hopefully it's making you question. Some of you may be thinking, nah, Lisa, I don't agree with you. That's fine. Some of you may be going, wow, that's really refreshing. That's actually been my experience. Wherever you're landing, however this is landing for you, there's no right or wrong. It's simply, let's think about this. Let's get more curious about this. Let's look at those places in us, those beliefs that we have that either keep us from being fully present with our clients, fully authentic with our clients, and which ones actually support us in being able to be more deeply present, more deeply resonant, and ultimately more deeply attuned. Take care of yourselves. You are the most important toy in the playroom. Deep breaths. Grab hold of yourself the next time you feel activation and the countertransference arises. And trust. Trust that you have just hit that beautiful point where the co-arising and co-constructing of the past is coming into the present moment, trying, deeply trying, to recreate itself into new patterns, new memories, new stories, new neural wiring, new possibilities. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.